And I'm uh, really uh, excited to introduce uh, our next panel. It's Reproducing Networks, uh, which looks at the various ways in which uh, knowledge has been reproduced and shared through print and other means. And uh, I'm going to dispense with all uh, formality because I left the official bio sheet on my seat over there. And I can introduce, oh, don't worry, I, I know Professor John. I'm going to be able to, uh, I've got uh, Richard John uh, was a, uh, scholar on our scholarly advisory board for the uh, Benjamin Franklin Postal Project and uh, was instrumental in our, the early days, along with Bob Hauser, our executive officer, we convened a group of scholars uh, to cut across a range of different disciplines to help us think about how to approach the Benjamin Franklin Postal Projects. And Professor John came down from New York and was uh, extremely helpful for us because this was all new information to us and he was able to bring the weight of his uh, knowledge uh, to bear on that project. Um, now, he's a professor of history in uh, uh, journalism at Columbia University, but that official bio sheet has all of his publications on it. I don't have it. I think the way that Cameron uh, described him earlier this uh, morning is uh, better than that. Uh, was it the god of the postal history or the dean of postal history? Uh, but in any case, uh, Professor Richard John is going to be chairing and commenting on this panel. Thanks. I just want to take um, just a couple of seconds to, just to thank the organizers of this conference. These are fine papers, and it's a terrific topic, and this sort of thing doesn't happen uh, on its own. So it, it's a real pleasure and honor uh, to be here. Uh, we have uh, two uh, fine papers. I will introduce the presenters, and um, I have the order Cheng Bierman. I think that makes sense to go there. Did I pronounce your name right? Byerman. Yeah, I think we'll go in that order. Eileen uh, Kame Cheng received her PhD from Yale. She's an associate professor of history at St. Lawrence College. She's the author of The Plain and Noble Garb of Truth, Nationalism and Impartiality in American Historical Writing, 1784 to 1860, which was published in 2008 and Historiography, an Introductory Guide, published in 2012. And I just looked it up on Amazon and I discovered that such a book existed and I just bought it because it's got great notices. She's also written articles on loyalism in American historical writing and she's currently working on a book project on loyalist historians of the American Revolution and their legacy. And this project is entitled The Loyalist Historians and Their Legacy from British to American Nationalism. And I'll introduce Lee Behrman as well. She's a PhD candidate at Maastricht University. She's a member of the MUSTS, MUSTS, the Maastricht University Science, Technology, and Society Studies. Sure enough, lines right up, MUSTS. Uh, that research group, she holds a BA in Creative Writing and Journalism and a research Master of Science in the cultures of arts, sciences, and technology. Her PhD project looks at the history, and this is from her PhD project, and she's a first year student, you said, so very impressive to be this far along, looks at the history of microscopy in the 19th century, asking how circulating microscopy artifacts spurred the formation of an international community of microscopists. And as part of her PhD research, she runs a crowdsourcing project called Worlds of Wonder, that invites citizen scientists to identify and to classify 19th century microscopy illustrations. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Cheng. Mm -hmm. well, I'd like to thank the APS for the opportunity to present my paper to you today. So my paper, the subject of it is John Marshall, who I think is better known to most people as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court rather than as a historian, and his plagiarism from the loyalist George Chalmers and the Scottish Enlightenment historian Wilbert Robertson for his History of the American Colonies. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is to convey the main arguments of the paper uh, by highlighting some of the larger purposes that I'm trying to achieve with it. Uh, so basically, there are really two main purposes that I have in the paper. Uh, the first of those purposes uh, is to challenge how plagiarism has been portrayed as a historical practice, uh, has, how, that has, how that has been, co been conventionally portrayed um, by other historians. Uh, it's been well documented that plagiarism was widespread among the revolutionary historians, so Marshall was by no means the only one to be plagiarizing so heavily from other historians. 
Uh, and like Marshall, uh, many other of the revolutionary generation of historians plagiarized in particular from the loyalist historians and from British historians like Robertson. Uh, and so this paper is a case study that is part of a larger project looking at this widespread plagiarism from the loyalist and British historians. Uh, but usually uh, the use of this plagiarism has been portrayed and dismissed basically as a sign of how backward and unscientific these historians were in their scholarship. But what I'm trying to show in this paper is that uh, what I think Marshall's plagiarism demonstrates is that he was doing this not because he didn't know any better or because he was lazy or a bad historian, uh, but to the contrary, uh, that he was doing this as a very conscious interpretive choice uh, and that this choice served different purposes. And in particular, that his plagiarism was really serving as a mode of communication and discourse with the people he was plagiarizing from. Uh, and I think what you see with Marshall's plagiarism is that he plagiarized from a lot of different sources, not just Robertson and Chalmers. Uh, so he plagiarizes from earlier colonial historians, people like Robert Beverly or William Stith. He plagiarizes from other loyalists besides Chalmers. Um, he plagiarizes from Thomas Hutchinson, Alexander Hewitt, uh, William Smith. And he also plagiarizes from other revolutionary historians, people like Benjamin Trumbull and Jeremy Belknap. Uh, and I think there's an interpretive element to all this plagiarism in a number of different ways. Uh, there's an interpretive element in just whom he chooses to plagiarize from for a given topic, what he selects from that historian, uh, and then also how he's playing off these different historians against one another. Uh, that often what he does is he'll plagiarize from several different historians in the same passage, and he'll take little bits and pieces from each of them and combine them all in his own way. Uh, and finally, I think there is an interpretive element uh, in the way he's paraphrasing and modifying what he's taking from these historians. Uh, and so I think far from being lazy, actually there's a lot of work involved in the way that he's bringing together these materials and modifying them for his own purposes. And so he's not just mindlessly copying from his sources. But I think what's most interesting uh, is that the two sources that he plagiarizes the most from and that he highlights as valuable sources in his preface are the loyalist George Chalmers and the British historian Will, uh, William Robertson. I think it's also significant that he doesn't mention anything about their political allegiances or feel any need to explain or apologize for his use of a loyalist and a British writer. And in fact, as you can see from some of the quotes that I include in the paper, he speaks very favorably of them. Um, and this is even though uh, Chalmers in particular was known to Marshall's American contemporaries for the virulence of his loyalism and for being very critical of the colonists and of the revolution. Uh, so there, you know, there's an exchange between John Adams and Jeremy Belknap where you know, John Adams calls Chalmers a bitter Tory and, and Jeremy Belknap says, you, know, you can't trust Chalmers, you know, he has a lack of candor. Um, and yet in Marshall's references to Chalmers, you would have no idea that he was a loyalist. So the larger question that I'm grappling with in the paper is you know, what was the appeal of these loyalist and British histories for Marshall and for the other early national historians who were plagiarizing from them? Why would they want to plagiarize from people who were against the revolution uh, when you would expect the opposite would be the case, especially since one of the main goals of these historians uh, was to promote nationalism and vindicate the revolution? Uh, and so I think as I try to show in the paper, a part of the answer in Marshall's case is that he was using this plagiarism as a means of arguing with Robertson and Chalmers, of proving them wrong about their fears of the harmful effects of the revolution. Uh, and so I think behind the chauvinistic nationalism that Marshall expresses in his history, there's actually some anxiety and insecurity uh, that the loyalists and the British may have been right in their fears that the revolution was just gonna bring social disorder and, and chaos to America. And I think these fears are fed by the political context in which Marshall is writing. He's writing at a time where there's a lot of you know, party conflict between the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans. There's you know, the ele election of Jefferson in 1800. There's Gabriel's Rebellion in Virginia. And I think all of these forces are creating a certain fear in Marshall 
that the United States might not hold together. Uh, so I think in trying to prove the Loyalists and the British wrong, in a way, he's trying to reassure himself and other Americans uh, that the revolution really was a good thing after all, and that it was all going to work out. And his ultimate way of doing this was by turning the words of the Loyalists and the British against themselves and twisting those words to show how the colonists, and by implication, Americans of Marshall's time, could prosper and succeed through their ability to balance freedom with order, contrary to what Robertson and Chalmers were arguing in their accounts. Uh, Marshall's decision to plagiarize from a loyalist points to the other purpose that I have in the paper, uh, and that is to challenge conventional perceptions of the loyalists as losers, um, who were marginalized both by their defeat in the revolution and also from American historical consciousness afterwards. And I think the clearest expression of that marginalization is how the loyalists were portrayed uh, in accounts of the revolution, both by Marshall and by other early national historians. Uh, and for, for the most part, what you see in those histories uh, is that the loyalists are either just vilified as supporters of tyranny or they're, they're left out altogether. Uh, but again, the, what's interesting and somewhat paradoxical is that even as Marshall and other nationalist historians are excluding the loyalists as historical subjects, they're relying very heavily and plagiarizing from loyalist histories to promote their exceptionalist vision of the United States. And so what I think is that the, Marshall's plagiarism it shows that the loyalists were actually a more important influence on American historical consciousness and national identity than has been commonly assumed. And so I think ultimately there's something paradoxical about Marshall's use of plagiarism as a tool for uh, defining American identity. On the one hand, through this plagiarism, Marshall was making himself part of this transatlantic dialogue and, and circuit of knowledge with people like Robertson and Chalmers. And yet, at the same time, what he was doing with that dialogue was to separate himself from them and to separate the United States from Britain and to show uh, America's distinctiveness as a nation. So I think in this respect, uh, the kind of network that Marshall formed with Robertson and Chalmers through his plagiarism was perhaps somewhat different from some of the other networks that have been described in some of the other papers. Uh, and I think it's different in that it was a network that's defined as much by difference and disagreement as it was by consensus and collaboration. So Marshall was not engaged in any kind of common project with Chalmers and Robertson in the way that I think some of the natural historians or scientists discussed in some of the other papers were engaged in. But in fact, Marshall was using his appropriations from these historians to further a goal that was completely opposed to theirs, the goal of defending the revolution and celebrating America as a nation. So I think in this way, Marshall's plagiarism shows how it was possible for networks to divide as well as to bring people together, even amongst people belonging to the same network. Uh, so I think I'll end on that point, and thank you for listening. Yeah, hello. Um, first of all, thank you to the APS um, for having me. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this conference. It's been quite interesting so far. Um, my PhD project um, looks at um, 19th century microscopy, um, how uh, the circulation of microscopy-related artifacts, um, instruments, specimens, publications, um, how that made it possible to um, exchange microscopic observations 
um, and also to, to introduce the microscope into um, lots of different disciplines and organizations and how the microscope then also shape the scientific practices within these organizations and disciplines. Um, at the moment, I'm particularly interested in how microscopy illustrations um, circulated and uh, in how um, these microscopy illustrations were used to, to communicate um, microscopic observations um, among microscopists across disciplinary and across national boundaries. Um, as you can probably imagine, um, these microscopy publications were richly illustrated. They really tried to, um, they, they tried to recreate that world uh, of wonders that you could see through the microscope. Um, and around the mid-19th century, there was a steep um, rise in microscopy um, publications and illustrated publications. Um, because microscopes were becoming more affordable, um, there were new printing techniques introduced that made these publications more affordable. Um, microscopy societies were established, um, so this community of microscopists um, grew, and also um, their publications were circulated um, more widely. And there, there were more publications, microscopy publications available. Um, and also, and I think this is, um, ties in nicely with Aline's um, paper, which I think is in many respects a more elaborate version of my paper, um, copyright laws were not really internationally enforced at the time. Um, I mean, there were debates um, ongoing, um, and at, at the end of the century, um, copyright laws were established. Um, but um, in the mid-19th century, this was not um, so much of an issue. Um, so illustrations were really um, copied a lot. They were um, reproduced um, and circulated widely. Um, my microscopy journals especially, they um, invited microscopists often to, um, to contribute their own observations. Um, so these um, journals really helped circulate microscopy illustrations very widely. Um, what I'd like to find out with my project, um, these are just a few of the, the, the questions um, I'd like to be able to answer. Um, well, who contributed microscopy um, illustrations to 19th century um, publications? Um, were there, for example, uh, women we haven't yet heard about? Um, because often women were not allowed to, um, to be part of microscopy societies, but they were allowed to um, have their illustrations made and, and published. Um, how many illustrations show microscopic specimens? How many are maybe construction manuals? Um, was it possible for um, microscope users to um, build their, their own instruments? I mean, maybe not microscopes, but microtomes or um, anything else to, to somehow contribute to the construction of these instruments. Um, and also, whose illustrations were copied and where exactly did they travel? Did um, American illustrations travel um, to Europe or the, the other way around? Um, did that change at some point? Um, this is something I'd really like, like to know. And then finally, did these um, reproductions of um, illustrations also raise issues of ownership, authenticity? Um, how was that dealt with? Um, and I think um, the reason I got this project funded is um, <laughs> I'd also like to know uh, if this, all this can teach, us, can teach us anything about um, present day science communication. I mean, we all know that images still go viral today. Um, can, can we learn anything from um, 19th century reproductions, images going viral in a way? I mean, this is very presentist, but um, there are some parallels I think that maybe we can learn something from. Um, and in order to answer at least some of these questions, um, I launched a crowdsourcing project, a crowdsourcing citizen science project. Uh, it's called Words of Wonder. It was launched in April, so it's still really new. Um, and I, I launched it together with um, my supervisors, uh, Cyrus Modi, Rafter Bond, and uh, Stefanie Genger in Cologne. Um, and uh, the project is hosted by Zooniverse, which is, I think, the biggest citizen science platform. Um, the publications used um, are hosted by the Biodiversity Heritage Library, a big online archive, basically. Um, and uh, the, the project invites citizen scientists to um, identify illustrations in microscopy publications, uh, to um, tag them, use a keyword so they, 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 they can be searched, basically. That I can um, look into these illustrations and see if a specimen reappeared somewhere um, it, that um, I mean, that, that specimen may have been, that particular illustration of that specimen may have been re reproduced, and I, I'm, I'm able to see that by um, searching these annotated illustrations, basically. Um, and they're also um, uh, asked uh, to flag re reproductions of illustrations. So if some citizen scientist sees um, an illustration that looks eerily familiar, they're asked to um, say, well, th this is something that I, I've, I've seen before, this may be re reproduced, and then I'm able to, to find out um, if, if it was re reproduced. <laughs> 
Um, at the moment, it's mostly British and American publications, um, but that may change in the future. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, that's the, the basic workflow, the um, series of tasks that citizen scientists are assigned. Um, they ask if there are any illustrations on this page um, to choose the type of illustration. Um, to mark any handwritten captions and contrib contributors, because sometimes people would sign the, their, their illustrations and then we can identify them um, quite easily. Um, they ask about to, to um, transcribe handwritten captions only because uh, machine written text um, can be searched quite easily, but it's a bit more difficult with um, handwriting. Um, so that makes it possible to, to still search handwritten, te handwritten texts. Um, and they're asked to um, add keywords so I can yeah, search illustrations for specimens, for example or instruments by certain manufacturers. Um, and then uh, one thing that um, has become very important, I didn't really anticipate that, um, is the Worlds of Wonder talk forum. Um, every Zooniverse project comes with a talk forum. Um, and on on the, the, the one hand, it's um, very useful to um, uh, identify problems. Um, people can, can, can just say that uh, they, they don't like uh, classifying this or that publication, that something's not going right. Um, but, but also, um, we, we can have this, this kind of um, conversation about history, and this is really interesting, I think. That, um, some people are really enthusiastic about researching um, this stuff, um, <laughs> and this is quite um, um, yeah, fa fascinating for me to see that, um, for example, here, uh, a citizen scientist um, really um, try to track down these um, micro, uh, sorry, uh, photomicrographs um, of oleomargarine, I think, butter and fats. Um, and sh she found out where, where they were re re reproduced, um, who made them. Um, and in the end, she says, this rabbit hole is getting deeper by the minute, climbing out now while I still can. Um, so she really got um, in, in, into this and um, really enjoyed doing that. This is something um, that, that makes this project also really interesting for me. And this is something that um, I think shapes my own, my own research, um, because I, I can see things I um, didn't anticipate, really, like oleomargarine being very, very um, important, apparently. Um. Um, some very preliminary um, results. I mean, the project started in, uh, in April, so it's still very new. I don't have any fancy vis visualizations or anything. Um, some general insights uh, from um, talking with people online, basically. Uh, the first thing is that citizen scientists uh, seem to be interested in female illustrators. They made their own little collections of female illustrators. Um, and they started searching for um, information on unpublished illustrators. Uh, and so something that's really um, helpful there is uh, that the Biodiversity Heritage Library and the Internet Archive uh, recently introduced um, full text search. I think it's only been introduced um, for a year or so. Um, and you can. Um, then, then use that full text search for piecing together inform, um, biographical information about actors that did not publish, um, that um, do not have any correspondence left, basically. Um, so I could um, yeah, identify people and find out things about people who, um, uh, who attended society meetings, for example. Um, and they, they appear in text, but they did not pu publish themselves. And this is really good to have, then, this full text search to find out more about these lesser known historical actors. Um, for some reason, American publications seem to contain more agricultural microscopy illustrations, uh, which is why I'm going to visit the, um, the, the, the Department of Agriculture in about two weeks to find more, more about that. Um, and then finally, many illustrations were apparently uh, copied from German publications. Um, and one of the, the citizen scientists says that she um, has some German and would be, ha would be happy to look into them. Um, so this is a reason to, to upload them, I think, and something I, I, I'll do in the future, I hope. Um, so I think basically, basically what I'm trying to say is that um, I'm, I'm not only um, retracing networks with, with this project, I'm also building my own networks in a way, and this is really um, yeah, hel helpful for my own project and has um, taken me into the directions I didn't really anticipate. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, the theme of this panel, Reproducing Networks, nicely links together the papers by Professors Cheng and Bierman, or Dr. Ms. Bierman and Professor Cheng, yeah, in two distinct ways. Okay, first, it reminds us that both papers are concerned with the reproduction of words and images in space and time. 
that is, with the circulation of what Bruno Latour famously called immutable mobiles. And second, each has a particular interest in the way in which these words and images are transformed as a result of their circulation. That is, the circulatory process itself is generative in the sense that it hastened the creation of new knowledge, the second meaning of reproduction. Like many of the projects showcased at this conference, Cheng and Bierman take advantage of the affordances made possible by optical scanning. The digital humanities in the past decade or so have been the subject of a great deal of attention, and indeed, hype. Cheng and Bierman are demonstrating how the remarkable array of digitally mediated tools that are now at our disposal can be used to refine our understanding of significant moments in what, 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 what one might call the history of knowledge. Cheng's paper shows how, in his celebrated biography of George Washington, U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Marshall selectively appropriated not only the ideas but also the phraseology of two chroniclers of colonial America, the Scottish lawyer turned antiquarian George Chalmers and the Scottish minister turned historian William Robertson. Chalmers and Robertson each underscored the importance of commerce in world history, a theme that Marshall embraced, and each found it challenging to balance order and commerce. Right? This was a tension in their writings. This was a tension that Marshall also wrestled with in his own history and indeed in his own life. Americans, in Marshall's view, and here I quote Cheng, were uniquely able to balance commercial prosperity with social order, a conclusion that would have broad implications not only for Marshall's historical imagination but also for his jurisprudence, and this was a, a balancing that Chalmers and Robertson uh, were unable uh, to make. Marshall's history differed from Chalmers and Robertson's in a second related way, for Marshall also rejected the philosophical history, this was a theme in her paper but not so much in her presentation, the philosophical history that Chalmers and Robertson embraced, an approach that led them to characterize the American past as a chapter in universal history. In the place of universal history, Marshall substituted an exceptionalist account, Cheng's word, exceptionalist account of the American past that foregrounded the uniqueness of the American experiment in Republican government while helping to fashion for his American readers a distinctively American identity. Cheng refers to Marshall's appropriation of Chalmers and Robertson as plagiarism, then as now a morally laden term, and she was able to find the term in uh, one of Marshall's um, uh, passage from his history. When, for example, it, it became known, examples, that Martin Luther King had plagiarized his doctoral thesis, this was regarded as a black mark against his reputation. Today's Democratic presidential contender Joe Biden finds himself in a similarly morally compromising position following the recent disclosure that physician papers that his staff had prepared lifted passages from reports issued by nonprofits and so on. Cheng, wisely in my view, is not really interested in the question of culpability. Her essay, that is, is not a gotcha expose, and this is as it should be. Conventions concerning plagiarism, like everything else, have changed over time. And here I put in a plug for Will Slaughter's Who Owns the News, a fine recently published book that makes the very good point that it was impossible to copyright news Anglo-American world, I wonder about factual accounts such as those that Marshall drew on. So far more important for Cheng than the question of plagiarism is the selectivity of Marshall's appropriation. Having established that Marshall borrowed from Chambers and Robertson, Cheng explores themes that Marshall found useful and those that he did not. Her conclusion on this score is particularly intriguing. Marshall is more sympathetic to the patriot cause than Chambers than Cham Chambers, a loyalist, and he was less racialist than Robertson, who, as it turns out, to borrow a phrase from William Freeling, was an unconditional perpetualist with regard to the institution of slavery, as Marshall was not. The knowledge that Marshall created, that is, and that the publication of his biography of Washington put into circulation, built on, while modifying in intriguing ways, the knowledge that had been recorded in the books upon which he so largely relied. For Cheng, optical scanning makes it possible to challenge a perennial question, the distinctive, or to engage a perennial question, the distinctiveness of American historiography. Bierman, in contrast, has used the affordances of optical scanning to ask a series of new questions about the circulation of a very distinctive kind of knowledge, namely 
the visual representation in 19th century European books of a specific kind of microscopic animal known as rotifers. Well, I never heard of before, but I read a lot about in her paper. Byerman's account revolves around two 19th century British microscopists, Philip Henry Goss, whose drawings of rotifers were frequently appropriated. He was really good at drawing rotifers. And Thomas Bolton, who used innovative printing techniques to circulate fly leaves with descriptions of the live specimens that he sent to naturalists and would-be naturalists through the mail. It's kind of a crowdsourcing in reverse. He's sending things out to ordinary folks, and Beerman is relying on these folks to help interpret the data. Beerman is interested in tracking the circulation of these fly leaves, which previous scholars have often neglected. Bolton, she concludes, was a provincial microscopist with an international reputation because of this business engaged in. Two questions about Beerman's paper, then I'll get off the stage. The first is the perennial, so what, question. Now that we've identified the network in which Bolton flourished, what does this tell us about 19th century natural history, or more broadly about the history of knowledge? Is there any way of determining how these fly leaves were used? If I understand Beerman's argument, the fly leaves were used as complements to the live specimens that were Bolton's stock and trade, live specimens of these microscopic creatures. If this was true, can it be demonstrated that the fly leaves shaped the imagination of their intended audience? That they used the, in effect, the images of the microscopic creatures to draw the images, or do they rely on them? microscopic creatures themselves. My second question concerns the distribution, you might not be surprised that I'm asking this question, the distribution mechanisms that Bolton relied on. If he, indeed, if he did indeed rely on the post office, as her account implies, might it not be useful to learn more about just how all this worked? Presumably these live specimens being sent through the mail only lived for a certain period of time. Might Bolton's project have been inspired by changes in postal policy, or more broadly by the expansion of the information infrastructure? And if so, might this infrastructure have been just as important as microscopy and autographic printing, a new technique that Bolton uses, might have been just as important as those two affordances? as an agent of change. Well, these questions are those of a non-specialist who's intrigued by the world of wonders that Bierman has opened up. Bierman reminds us in her introduction that historians of science have informed us that innovations in science are neither necessarily linear, they're not necessarily linear, and they're not necessarily top-down. I have no doubt that iconographic tracking can help us to take advantage of these insights. Cheng has provided us with one template by revising historical or revisiting a historical perennial, and Bierman is opening up a new way of thinking about the history of knowledge. I look forward to learning more about both projects, for they promise to illuminate lost worlds. Thank you. I invite the speakers to respond to um, Professor John's comment. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, I wasn't sure if you had a question or comment, or maybe I'll just comment on the point you raised about just how I'm using the term, oh, I shouldn't use the term. Plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism. Uh, and <laughs> you're right, I mean, I'm, I'm not interested in condemning these earlier historians like Marshall for their plagiarism, and, and quite the opposite, that Part of my goal in trying to challenge the conventional way that plagiarism has been portrayed is, is really to historicize the idea of plagiarism and to look at what plagiarism meant for people in Marshall's time and for him. And so uh, they did have a concept of plagiarism. Uh, and, and Marshall says, oh, you know, I, I want to uh, preempt charges of plagiarism by telling you straight out, you know, I, I did copy some of the language from my sources. So he seems in his mind to think as long as he makes it open, the copying is not plagiarism, whereas by today's standards, it would be considered plagiarism. Uh, and so I think the use of terminology, though, is, is a tricky one for me. One, because plagiarism is a very contested concept at that time. So there's not even necessarily agreement amongst people at that time over what constitutes plagiarism. Um, and then also, there's the issue of I use the term plagiarism to describe what Marshall's doing because by our standards, it would be considered plagiarism. But in doing that, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, am I then going against my goal of historicizing the idea of plagiarism, but I haven't come up with a, a better way of terming what he's doing. Um, 
So, so yeah, that, that's an issue I'm still grappling with in, in working on this project. All right, then, um, two questions for me. Um, first one was uh, the so what. Um, what does this network tell us about um, natural historical practices? Um, how were the fly leaves used? Is this something I can say or not? Um, I think part of my argument is that um, by looking um, or using this optical character recognition and using full text search, uh, we can find out how um, objects are used. Uh, for example, I can I can look into um, uh, texts, uh, so, so searching them for for Bolton's name and uh, looking if um, seeing if he comes up, and then what people say about him or his specimens, how they use them. Um, for example, I found that um, the, these um, specimens he sent they were uh, they they were not pure samples. Often, other specimens um, would be contained in these tubes as well, and then the illustrations he sent along with them would make sure that people pick the right specimen in a way from the tube. Um, so it did influence scientific practices, I think, um, this sending of specimens. Um, and then about the distribution mechanism, the, the post. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, changes in the postal system um, was, were um, the, the pre prerequisite, I, I would say, to, to this distribution mechanism to Bolton's business. Um, I think I should also mention there that um, there were also at least two, maybe more, postal microscopical societies. Um, that um, relied on uh, a chain letter principle of um, exchanging specimens and uh, notes. Um, they then, they never, never met in person, but they had these networks um, of exchanging uh, specimens. Um, so yeah, this distribution aspect is very important and something I'll look, look into, I think, um, more in the future. <laughs> um, and I'll definitely, I'll definitely write about these, these post-microscopical clubs as well. I um, hope that answers the, the questions. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Young. So you talked a lot about how Marshall fears, you know, you know, and is trying, you know, th that the American experiment might fail, and that, you know, he's trying to validate the revolution, argued that it really succeeded. I'm wondering if you think he was a believer in and promoter then of this uh, conspiratorial anglophobia, which is the belief that. The, col the British had a, a plan in action to recolonize the United States and remove them from their independent status. And he, if he was refuting that or promoting it, you know, what his opinions of that were? Um, yeah, I don't know if that was something that he had on his mind. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, what your comment makes me think of Alan Taylor's book and the sense that, you know, before the War of 1812, that on both sides, you know, the revolution wasn't really over. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, the U.S. had this idea, oh, we can take Canada. And then on the other side, the British thought, oh, we can expand from Canada and take back the U.S. Um, so I think maybe in a kind of a general sense, that feeling, well, the revolution isn't quite settled yet could have been in the back of, of Marshall's mind. But so far in the sources that I've looked at, I don't know that he necessarily had any kind of sense of, you know, that there's some kind of conspiracy on the part of the British to, to kind of be retaking um, the United States. And, and I think also what complicates this is Marshall was a Federalist in his political sympathies, which was the party that was more inclined to the British. So um, I, I think the people who had more of that conspiratorial mindset were more likely to be on the Jeffersonian Republican side. Uh, this is a question for uh, Leah Byerman. Um, I love the project, and I just actually went on to Zooniverse and transcribed a couple of uh, pages. It was really fun. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about plans for, um, if there are plans to kind of distribute some of the data from this crowdsourcing project more broadly. And in particular, I'm thinking about this. I just was at a workshop on uh, computer vision and deep learning, um, and I'm thinking how this would actually be an incredible data set for training neural networks to do things that are recognizing images that are not just 21st century images, which my understanding is the kind of dominant uh, way in which this technology is being used now, but to develop like a kind of infrastructure for uh, automatic image classification or recognition for say 19th century imagery. Um, and I was just wondering if there are any plans for that. Yeah, um, so we have some kind of internal plans. Uh, we have the Data Science Institute in Maastricht, um, and we're working with them um, because they're also trying to uh, develop their own machine learning uh, uh, algorithms, um, and they try to, to do that with the da data we generate in our project. Um, 
Also, I'm myself, I'm using the data of um, a project, I, uh, a group I interned with two years ago, the Science Gossip Project, which is quite similar to, to my project in, uh, in many, many ways, actually. Um, so it's really important, I think, to, to um, use the, the, the data and not just um, tuck it away uh, somewhere and then uh, um, not, not use it anymore. And I'm going to, definitely I'm going to um, include it um, on, on GitHub. Um, and I'm also trying to, to share it with the volunteers, of course. Um, online um, and, and through, through uh, wor workshops, um, basically. Um, uh, I had, um, I think, two workshops so far about um, machine learning and citizen science, so I do that, um, yeah. Okay, there was one more question. Um, Dr. Chung, did you do a, percent, a percentage analysis of, just to say, uh, how many pages, how many whole paragraphs, how many entire paragraphs out of Marshall's book are straight out of Chalmers and the other? Writer? Uh, As no. A I didn't. Add, I, I think this ties into something Richard alluded to in terms of the use of OCR and digital humanities. Um, that I use um, uh, digital techniques in a limited way, but most of what I did to identify the plagiarism was kind of the old fashioned way of just kind of reading and kind of looking for things that reminded me of things I had read in other sources. So I, I, it's, it's not a systematic quantitative analysis. Um, and that's where I, I, I've looked into trying to use digital humanity to do more of that kind of quantitative analysis that you talk about. So far, I haven't found anything that can perform what I need. Uh, I've, I've looked at collation software, which is the closest, but the one that I looked at juxta it, it doesn't handle large texts like the ones that I'm looking at. Um, so ideally, I'd like to be able to do that kind of percentage analysis, but I think I'd have to basically learn coding and, and write my own program to be able to do that. Great, well, it's been a long stretch. So I propose um, that we take a short break. We'll reconvene here at uh, 3.15, but um, please join me in thanking our panelists.